Welcome to Fruity Knitting. I'm Madeline. And I'm Andrea. And this is episode 135. For new viewers, Fruity Knitting is a 90 minute program that brings you knitting inspiration from around the world, as well as some snippets of travel, history, and storytelling that we hope adds joy to your life and brings a smile to your face. And we have a really fun program for you. Our feature interview is with Charlotte Stone, who's the designer behind Stone Knits, and this book, Charming Colorwork Socks, so we did this interview in April during the Swiss Yarn Festival and I don't think I've ever laughed so much while filming an interview. So Charlotte comes from the UK and she's been living in Switzerland for around 15 years. And since we're both English speaking expats living in German speaking countries, we really clicked over the similarities between our lives and our experiences. And as, as you're gonna see very soon, Charlotte has a hilarious sense of humor. So Charlotte's quirky colorful socks are hugely popular. This book became an international bestseller in the category of knitting books and it's also been translated into German and Korean. So each sock design has a distinct theme like nature or a hobby or a holiday or food related and it's Charlotte's goal to produce a sock design for every personality out there and there's definitely a design in here that suits my habit of eating eggs for breakfast every single day and Madeline's also found a favorite design which she's going to show you later yeah so what's really unique about the images that Charlotte uses in her sock designs is that they're all original drawings she doesn't just use already published feral motives and that's really challenging to do because each little image or picture needs to be instantly recognizable and simultaneously very knitter friendly so the floats can't be too long and she's limited to using two colors per row with just the occasional use of duplicate stitch and also each stitch is like a pixel in a picture and it really has to count to make the image clear because she's only got a set amount of stitches that she can work with anyway so we discuss all of this during the interview and Charlotte shows us her drawing process, including what went wrong and how she improved on it. So it's very informative and you'll learn lots about sock knitting, but it's also hilarious fun because of her crazy sense of humor. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Uh, and mum and I have finished projects to share in Bring and Brag and new projects to show you in Under Construction, including a lengthy update on mum's wedding, well, not your wedding, but <laughs> your beaded, beaded lace, lace wedding, wedding shawl sure. that you're knitting for, Sophia. Yeah. And as you can see, I've finished my Cine Top by Xenia Nideon from Life is Cozy. And I'm excited to announce that we're featuring Xenia and her beautiful designs as our knitter of the world for this episode. Xenia is originally from the Ukraine, but she's been living in San Francisco since 2017. And actually, our Knitters of the World segment is early in the program, so we're going to start with Madeline in Bring mm -hmm. and Brag, so you can show the viewers all about the top before they meet the designer. Sure. So the center top is a summer t-shirt knitted in fingering weight yarn in a sideways construction, and the pattern includes instructions for both a longer and a cropped version. As you can see, I chose the cropped version, and I'm quite, quite glad I did because it ended up taking me quite a bit of time to knit the whole thing. Yeah. And it's nice to have it finished before summer is over. Anyway, I'm really happy with the end result. So I'm substituting the recommended yarn with one from the Norwegian brand Sandnesgarn. It's called Tunlina and it contains 53% cotton, 33% viscose and 14% linen. And Tunlina comes in 31 different colors, all of which are really pretty but I was attracted to this really bright and fresh green because I think it works very well for this design. And to keep it crisp, I chose this off-white as the contrast color. So some things I like about this yarn and some things I dislike about it. I'm really pleased with the colors and the yarn drapes really beautifully, but it also splits very easily, which meant I always had to keep my eyes on my knitting. And I found that a bit annoying because usually when you're knitting plain stocking stitch, you can easily look up and I was knitting a lot in the company of other people. I prefer to have eye contact when I'm talking to someone, but the danger of splitting my yarn was just made it impossible in this case. Did you lose any friends? No, <laughs> not so far, but I think I might have been seen as slightly antisocial. <laughs> um, anyway, I searched the internet for answers as to why this might be the case, and splitting does seem to be a universal problem with plant fibers. Um, can, so they do tend to split more than animal fibers because they don't stick together as well. And this could partly be because plant fiber has less crimp and is yeah. therefore less cohesive. 
but also animal fibers are protein based and most of them including human hair are covered in scales mm. so in cold temperatures those scales will lie flat they'll close and with heat they'll open up and when the scales are opened they can interlock with each other making the individual fibers stick together and that's also why if the temperature changes too rapidly or too strongly while you're washing your woolen garments you end up felting the fabric yeah but plant fibers on the other hand are made up of cellulose they don't have they don't have nice scales so you need to um, twist them more tightly to prevent them from unwinding again but in my opinion, this yarn has a fairly loose twist and I'm sure Santner's yarn has good reasons for designing it this way. Maybe it makes it softer, but I also think it would split less if it were spun more tightly. Anyway, apart from the splitting, I actually really like this yarn. Um, it's very soft and it's actually perfect to wear on a hot summer day, which is what I was going for. So overall, I think having to stare at my knitting slightly cross-eyed was worth the end result. Yeah. And uh, I also wanted to talk about the construction. So last episode, I talked a lot about the construction and how to adjust the pattern to your individual gauge. The recommended gauge is 26 stitches to 44 rows on 3.5 millimeter needles. My gauge, well, my swatched gauge was 25.5 stitches to 40 rows after being blocked. So it's a bit looser. And just as a reminder, because the top is knitted sideways, uh, the number of rows determines the width and the number of stitches on your needle determines the length of the top. And this means that you have to decide on how long you want your top to be right from the start. I ended up casting on 18 extra stitches, which was definitely a good idea, but I could have made it even longer to cover my belly button. Um, and apart from that, I also needed to change the neckline. So here's a schematic of the neckline that I showed you last episode. The neckline is meant to be a boat neck and as you can see in between the neck decreases and increases are several plain rows where you neither decrease nor increase. And this is where you adjust the number of rows if your row gauge differs from the recommended gauge. My row gauge is looser than the recommended gauge so I reduced the number of rows in this section otherwise the top would have been too wide. So I did this and I ended up with a slight v-neck at the front because I, I only had two plain rows before I had to increase again. Usually this would have been six centimeters wide, but it's not very steep. So I think it still works well with a boat neck at the back. It isn't a true boat neck, but I think it actually dips down really nicely. I like the curve that's resulted. Mm -hmm. And I also think the length is good. So Thank I think you. It's, yeah, looking really good. One more thing. Because the width of the top is determined by the number of rows, you can't really add any waist shaping unless you use the technique maybe like short rows for the first and the last section of the top. And this would result in fewer rows around the waist compared to the shoulders. Um, but this design doesn't have any waist shaping. So instead, Xenia adds the option to fold over the hem and to insert an eye cord with which you can then pull the top tightly around your waist. So I chose this option. I think it looks a lot better with the eye cord. But knitting the eye cord took a little bit of patience because per row you only have three stitches. So I would highly recommend using short double pointed needles for this part. Yeah, because if you're constantly changing between needles, having little short ones is so mm. much easier. Yeah. Saves time. Yeah, so that's my center top. It's looking great. And we're staying in Bring and Brag because I've also finished my top. <laughs> this is the Summer Lacy Top by Debbie Bliss. And there are a few similarities between both of our tops because this one's also cropped and it's also worked in a sideways construction. Yeah. So here's a close-up picture. There's a pretty leaf lace pattern on the sleeve cuffs and under the arms along the sides of the body. And the central part of the body is knitted in an easy chevron lace pattern. It's knitted in two pieces, as I said, worked sideways. And each piece is knit from the sleeve to the center seam. Then the right and left halves of the top are joined together with a centre front and centre back seam. And that's done with a three needle bind off. And at the end you finish the square neckline and waistband with a one by one ribbing. So I'm also really delighted how my top turned out. But I have to say the one by one ribbing was pretty tedious and took quite a long time. But that's to be expected since it's lace weight. Mm. And the yarn that I used is the Debbie Bliss Rialto Lace Weight Yarn, which I really loved using. So 
it was very it's very soft and it's very durable there's no sign of any peeling and unlike Madeline's yarn it didn't split at all so it was actually heavenly unfortunately it's been discontinued so that's really sad um, it's always the best yarns get discontinued yeah. it's Wasn't like there the one best from lipstick. Rowan as well that got discontinued <laughs> heaps that, yeah. that I really loved hmm. yeah oh well and every time I find a lipstick that I really love yeah. next time I go and buy it it's discontinued <laughs> except for Angela Merkel's was it naked, naked flesh? Naked flesh? I thought she wore really bright Oh, red. no, mein Chancellorette. <laughs> naked flesh is the nation's favorite. <laughs> okay. Getting back to my top. I didn't do any modifications on this top, which is quite unusual, but the pattern actually just suited exactly what I want. So I'm very happy with that. Uh, what else? Oh, yes. So Germany has had some terrible weather lately. It's just got cold. So I'm really hoping that we get a bit more warm weather before autumn sets in and I can wear it at least a couple of times. Yes, please. So because I've been doing a lot of lace knitting lately and I've been working on my beaded lace wedding shawl, which I'm going to show you very soon. Last episode, we started a lace knit along in our fruity knitting Ravelry group. And I'm really thrilled to say that the thread is very, very active and there's lots of beautiful lace projects being knit and shown there. So go and have a look if you haven't already. To join in the knit along, go to our Ravelry group, find the thread, introduce yourself, tell us about your knitting history and share your plans and ideas for your lace project. And the guidelines for the Carl are, it has to be a large garment. Well, actually it has to be a large project. So either a adult size garment or a, sh a shawl or a hap or a blanket so and at least one third of it has to be done in lace of course you can do a hundred percent lace if you want but the idea is to really give yourself a good challenge but at the same time to relax and enjoy yourself because there are experienced lace knitters in the group who are very happy to give you lots of encouragement and a little bit of advice and I am super relaxed with deadlines so there's no need to worry there either. Mm. Now, the last time we did a lace knit along was six years ago in 2017. And as I've said before, Andrew wrote the guidelines for the knit along back then, and they're really good. So that's why we're repeating them again in his memory. And I want to take this opportunity to show new viewers and to remind our long term viewers of a couple of the lace projects that Andrew knitted for me. So this one here, and if you can help me hold it up, mm -hmm. was his very first attempt of late of lace knitting. And it's a, designed by Martin Story. And I find this panel, central panel here really striking. It's pretty mm -hmm. easy lace. And it's combined with twisted stitches and cabling. So as I said, it's Andrew's first attempt at lace. And I think he did a really great job of it. Did he knit everything? Yeah. Yeah. He loves stocking stitch. It's beautiful. It's I really love this beautiful. Top. I want to yes. steal it. It needs to have a wash, but didn't manage <laughs> to get it done. And his very last project was this lace mm. design here. It's got a, um, what do you call this? A teardrop opening at the back neck. This is a design by Lisa Richardson. And the lace on these sleeves here is so complicated. I knitted a couple of rows of this to have a go at it. And it was certainly the most complicated lace I've ever knitted because you're working the lace pattern on both sides of the sleeve. So you don't get a break on the, on the purl sides and just happily purl along for one row. And every few rows, the stitch count changes dramatically. So I don't know if old long-term viewers would remember that Andrew set up a certain little system on the on the table back there where he'd have to really concentrate and he'd be moving pennies across for certain repeats just to keep it in his mind but he did a brilliant job of this and I'm really really lucky to have it yeah so and so in the end lace knitting ended up being his favorite type of knitting apart from stocking stocking stitch <laughs> so this design here was just a perfect combination for him as you can see and I think one of the reasons why lace knit why he loved lace knitting so much was because complicated lace is an interesting combination of interesting maths but also at the same time it's quite ethereal and magical just like a spider's web ethereal and magical isn't exactly what I associate with dad <laughs> yeah but he he really I suppose liked... it's the maths and, and the patterns the repeating patterns yes he really yeah. liked fine delicate stitches mm. and and patterns that could be created with them he did have a, a it is very gorgeous it's very intri intricate he must have had so much patience to do that it's so yes. fine <laughs> he had an in, in, 
intricate sense of style. Yeah. Anyway, so coming up next is a little fashion shoot with Madeline modeling both of our tops here. And we, for that, we go to our local yarn store, Mush and Vine, and straight after that, you'll meet the designer behind Life is Cozy in Knitters of the World. <laughs> singing a song and it's a good day for moving along yes it's a good day how could anything be wrong a good day from morning to night and it's a good day for shining your shoes and it's a good day for losing the blues everything to gain and nothing to lose a good day from morning till night I said to the sun, good morning, sun, rise and shine today. You know you got to get going if you got to make a showing. And you got the right of way, because it's a good day for paying your bills. And it's a good day for curing your ills. So take a deep breath and throw away the pills, because it's a good day from morning till night. and I am a full-time knitwear designer behind Life is Cozy. Uh, I was born and raised in Ukraine where I received a degree in mathematics and worked in the field for many years. I was uh, always knitting and crocheting and I think that at some time I acquired so many projects that I had to open my own Etsy store to start selling them off. Um, then in 2015 we moved to San Francisco and our lives changed so drastically that it only felt natural to give my lifelong love for, for fiber arts a proper chance. Um, designing comes instinctively to me. Also numbers and spreadsheets are my friends and I'm not afraid of grading sweaters for many, many sizes. That's why designing patterns was something that I decided to give a proper try. Knitting to me is a perfect pairing of these two things, of pure math and inspiration. It is a magical tool for translating things that are very ethereal into physical objects, and I don't think it will ever stop to amaze me. I love incorporating complex textures into my designs and combining them in new, unusual ways. Bobbles, naps, Japanese lace, Estonian lace, traveling stitches and cables are all among my favorites. Uh, my sweater designs often play with volume. Think balloon sleeves, bishop sleeves, 
lots of positive ease, straight silhouettes. Um, and as for the shawls, I usually prefer to use just a couple of colors and to concentrate on texture and drape. I would say that my patterns are created for adventurous knitters um, because uh, I love to explore different textures and I feel like the patterns speak about that. Uh, so if you're not afraid to learn a new stitch or two and to combine um, maybe something you didn't think is combinable, <laughs> then my patterns are for you. Um, a lot of my designs um, have video tutorials that I incorporate into them to help knitters understand uh, how to um, use a new technique and how to achieve the look that I was going for. Um, as for inspiration, most of my designs are named after plants because I find them mesmerizing. There is just so many you can draw from one plant, from textures to smells to uh, shapes of the leaves and even shadows that they cast. Uh, I will show you a few of my favorite designs now and tell you about the inspiration behind them. I uh, hope you enjoy them as much as I do. This design is Ardea Top. Um, I designed it specifically for Pom Pom magazine and it was featured on the cover of one of their issues. And now it is available as an individual pattern from the designer, me, directly. Um, this piece is knit sideways in two pieces. So you're knitting back and front separately and then using three needle bind off to join the pieces along the sides. Um, because you're doing the sideways construction, uh, the shoulder shaping is built into the fabric with increases and decreases. And same is done with the neckline shaping. Uh, after the pieces are finished and seamed together, uh, you're doing a little bit of the ribbing at the bottom and at the hem, and same at the arm openings. So uh, even though this piece may seem like too many little things coming together in one design, I feel like it is totally worth it because um, the textures here are absolutely amazing and a lot of knitters will look at it thinking, how exactly was it done? Um, the uh, textures feature Estonian braids that are worked um, perpendicular to the regular knitted fabric. And so when you're wearing the top, they look a little bit like cables going from top to the bottom. There's also slipped stitch pattern here uh, that looks uh, like small arrows going down. And we also have wrapped stitches that have a little bit of the uh, open work going on. Um, altogether, I feel like this piece would work best in uh, natural fibers because they can bring up the crispness of the textures as much as possible. For this piece, I used um, Juniper Moon Yarn Zoe, which is a combination of cotton and linen. And uh, the texture of the yarn is a little bit uneven, which highlights the textures of the design beautifully. The pattern is graded for 10 sizes from um, 30 to 62 inch chest, which is approximately 78 to 158 chest circumference. Uh, and there's also two lengths available for cropped pieces that you're seeing here and the full length piece. Um, it's also easy to adjust the length depending on your taste if you prefer something in between. All in all, I feel like this is a gorgeous summer piece that's very easy to style and wear. This design is called Senesia Top. I called it so uh, for the string of pearls, which is another name of the same plant that resembles the pattern of nubs that go from the very top of the sweater, slowly disappearing towards the bottom. Uh, this design features two different types of nubs, the ones that you can see on top that are a little bit more perked up, called anchored nubs, and smaller regular nubs that uh, come towards the bottom of the sweater. It also features twisted stitches, uh, a little bit of traveling lace, and um, wrapped Japanese stitches. 
And the most of it is worked in the round, which is one of my favorite things to do when you're working on a sweater. The only exception here is the black of the sweater, because as you can see, it is slightly elevated with short rows to guarantee a more comfortable fit. The uh, section on the top along the ribbing is worked back and forth for that. Um, I like this design because um, it covers 14 different sizes for chest circumferences from approximately 33 to 60 inches, which is 85 to 153 centimeters, and also comes in two lengths, the cropped one that you can see here, that uh, would, depending on your body, land approximately at the waistline and the full length that goes longer approximately to the hips. So uh, I would say that it is a pretty universal pattern that allows you to make a top that fits your needs as best as possible. Um, I made this design in a beautiful uh, wool, linen, and silk blend from uh, a fellow um, crafter that lives not far away from here, a sincere sheep. Uh, the yarn is naturally dyed and you can see how it has a slight sheen and a little bit of variation because of uh, the, how, how natural dye penetrates the fiber. I think that it elevates the textures and uh, helps the pattern shine. Um, in general, uh, I'd say that this piece, even though it has a lot of texture, is very easy to wear and to layer, um, maybe even to put under another knitted piece like a cardigan. This piece here is sycamore cardigan. It is named so for the California sycamores and the resemblance of the sleeves and the nubs that we have here with some of the features of the tree. Sycamore cardigan is worked from the top down seamlessly. It has a feature of saddle shoulders that are worked not separately, but all the way at the same time with the rest of the fabric. I uh, think of it as kind of a raglan increases that are placed slightly differently. Uh, that allows us to have this beautiful line of stitches going all the way from the top of the sweater into the sleeve without any interruption. Uh, the button band on the cardigan is worked at the same time with the rest of the body as well, which allows for minimal finishing once the sweater is done. Um, the uh, piece features lots of texture on the sleeves. We have Estonian braids, we have two types of nubs of different sizes, and we have seed stitch here. Uh, the bottoms of the sleeves are shaped to uh, give them the balloon effect, which I love a lot for layering because it allows you to wear this cardigan over almost any piece of clothing uh, without having the sleeves um, constrict your movements. I created this pattern for 13 sizes, uh, for chest circumferences from 36 to 64 inches. Um, the pattern also features directions for the cropped sweater, which you can see here as a sample, and for the full length sweater, which goes a slightly longer to the hips. Um, the pattern is also very easy to adjust because you're just going and stocking it. So you have the ability of um, stopping whenever you feel like the length fits you best. Um, that's probably it about this design. Let's have a look at the another one. Here we have Lata Shell. Lata means vines in Sanskrit, and that is something that I used as an inspiration for this piece. As you can see, there are beautiful vines going all along the shawl in a few different places, embellished with lots and lots of nubs. As you've probably noticed, this is one of the design elements that I use quite a lot. I feel like it gives pieces a beautiful pop of texture, and here, definitely, uh, it is taking to another level. We have a few different things here. We have Japanese lace and traveling stitches. We have wrapped stitches that embellish the stockinette. We have anchored nubs and we have embellished ribbing. Um, I'm also adding a tassel at the corner of the shawl because that's something I do quite often for my shawl designs. You're welcome to keep it off if you feel like it.
um, Lada is worked from a more narrow corner all the way to the top that is embellished with the ribbing. So uh, you have the ability to stop whenever you feel like it or whenever you run out of yarn. I used a beautiful non-superwash base from uh, a local friend uh, at the Royal Bee Yarn Company here in uh, Pacifica in California. Um, and I feel like non-superwash yarn is one of the best um, picks for this sort of designs because non-superwash yarn would hold the textures after the blocking absolutely beautifully. It makes the stitches crisp, it highlights all the design elements that you used uh, while working on your piece. Um, this design is definitely not uh, very beginner friendly, even though as with um, all of my patterns, I have quite a few video tutorials included in the pattern that show how to make the tricky stitches happen. Um, I would say that you have to follow the charts or the written instructions uh, quite attentively for the first um, bunch of rows to understand what the pattern looks like and get a hang of it. But then once you're doing it, uh, I feel like it is um, a very enjoyable and meditative knit. Here is Mallow Shawl. Uh, this is easily one of my favorite shawl designs because it is just done in one color in decay weight yarn uh, and it is very easy to style and wear with other knitted things. Uh, Mallow features lots and lots of textures and things that look a little bit like cables are actually traveling stitches, so you will not have to cable anything here. Um, there's a lot of Japanese textures used here, including the wrapped stitches in the middle here, the little wrapped panels going all the way up the shawl. Um, it is a lot of fun to knit and it requires just a little bit more than a thousand yards of uh, decay weight yarn. Mallow means protection, it means health, and I felt like uh, this design that was worked during the pandemic was something that could protect us on the level that knitters understand. It gives warmth, it gives a comfortable hug to wherever we need it. Uh, the shawl is designed so that you can stop whenever you run out of yarn because you're working from the tip to the top. Uh, and pattern repeats, even though they look pretty complex, become intuitive as you go and proceed through the fabric. Um, you can also add tassels, which I always do, uh, and I feel like they polish off the corners of the shawl beautifully. Never know how much I love you Never know how much I care When you put your arms around me I get a fever that's so hard to bear You give me fever When you kiss me, fever When you hold me tight Fever In the morning a Fever all through the night Sun lights up the daytime, moon lights up the night. I light up when you call my name, and you know I'm gonna treat you right. You give me fever when you kiss me, fever when you hold me tight. Fever in the morning, a fever all through the night. Everybody. So welcome back. Hope you enjoyed seeing Ksenia's beautiful designs. They actually remind me a little bit of Kim Hargrave's designs. Mm, yeah. Because they're classy and feminine. and They're also a bit sexy. Yes, the they've got time. that little sex <laughs> appeal to them. <laughs> Ksenia's kindly offering Fruity Knitting patrons a 25% discount of all her self-published patterns from her Ravelry store and her own website shop. So you can have two options to buy from. Ksenia has just shown you a selection of her sweater and shawl designs, but she also has socks, 
hats, mittens, home decor, toys and bags. So enjoy browsing through her shop and thanks very much to Ksenia for the discount. Every month we produce a new episode and each episode requires lots of planning, editing, research and of course knitting in the evenings before we can even film ourselves on the couch. We can't just film multiple episodes within one week and then evenly distribute that footage across the next few months. Instead, we have regular deadlines, which can make it difficult for us to find time for a holiday. So because most people are going on holiday during August, we've decided to wait until September to publish the next episode. But just to clarify, we will be working for most of August. Yes. However, towards the end, we're both taking one week off to go to Sophia's wedding. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to say that? Um, and after that, we're traveling to Denmark for two weeks to gather some more interviews for the show, which is exciting. And then we'll film episode 136. Now, we both love producing this show, but it does require a lot of resources. Besides travel expenses, we have to buy and replace our equipment, pay for editing software, and occasionally, unfortunately, employ tech support from the outside when things go wrong, and that can be quite costly for us. Also, when you work with film, you tend to use up a lot of storage and electricity, and we're investing our own time into this podcast. So all of this requires financial support. And that's why we ask our viewers to become Fruity Knitting patrons, so that producing the show remains financially viable to us. Now, our patrons make a small monthly contribution starting at the price of one coffee per month, which most people who watch our show can afford. So if you're watching, we ask you to please support our work and become a patron. Yes, and a huge thank you to the wonderful patrons who have been supporting Fruity Knitting over the years. We really appreciate it. Yes. So now we're in under construction with me. In the previous episode, I showed photos of the Hortensa beaded lace shawl. And since then, I have been diligently working on it. It's beautiful. <laughs> so my dear friend, Sophia Capella, is getting married at the end of August. And I am so excited to be knitting her wedding shawl. It's a huge privilege. And I don't think I've enjoyed a knitting project so long, so much mm. for ages. Yeah. I think it's just the double joy of knitting something with love for a very special person on an incredibly special occasion. So just to remind you what the finished shawl is going to look like, here's a photo of it. The design is by Anna Victoria, who I think is a UK designer. The name Hortensa means gardener, and the lace pattern resembles a mixture of flowers, leaves, and little flower buds, especially because of the beading. There are two variations for the middle section of the shawl. It can be done in plain stockinette or with lace and beads. And I think both versions look very elegant. It's a triangular shawl worked from the center top outwards. So you begin with a garter tab here, which is three stitches worked in garter stitch for several rows. Then you pick up stitches along the side of the tab. And from here, you work increases along each edge and at each side of the central stitch or the central spine. And this creates a triangle shape that grows out from the central point. But because there are two sets of increases along the edges and only one set in the center, the shawl shape becomes a curved wing shape that becomes wider than its depth. So symbolically, the word garden or a gardener, I think is perfect for a wedding because a garden is a place of rest and beauty and joy and harmony. So therefore a gardener is the keeper of rest, beauty, joy and harmony. I was really fortunate to be married to Andrew for 23 years. And I think a beautiful marriage is like a beautiful garden that needs to be consistently and lovingly looked after with care and patience and never to be taken for granted. It's a very romantic notion. Yes. <laughs> well, it is really. Yeah. I think, um, I think they're very, that's a very um, accurate simile. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> I can't think what I was going to say. The colour? Were you going to talk what about the colour? What was I going to say first? No, what I wanted to tell you is that I'm really glad that Sophia picked out this pattern because it's it's very beautiful, but it also has this very precious meaning behind it, mm. which I think is so perfect for a wedding. And now getting on to the practicality of knitting it, I rarely knit shawls and I've never done beading before. So I'm also really enjoying learning new techniques, but getting the correct 
beads, yarn and crochet hooks was not straightforward for me and involved a fair bit of trial and error, yeah. especially because everything is done under time pressure because knitting this shawl has been a fairly late decision for me. So the yarn I'm using comes from an online UK company called Color Mart that has fantastic prices. So this, for instance, this cone here is 100% cashmere. It has over 2,000 meters in length and it costs 45 pounds sterling, which I think is brilliant. Mm. It also comes in hundreds of colors, which is really appealing, but picking out colors online is really difficult. So Sophia picked out this color here, which is called Aurora, but when it actually arrived, we both thought it just looked too yellow. And you can really see that if I put a, a white piece of paper behind it there. So I decided to knit it up anyway, because I thought maybe once it's knitted up, it'll look less yellow. And it does look really, really pretty. Here it is here. I actually think the color would, would suit, suit you. my complexion. Yeah. But I didn't think it would suit Sophia's pale, cool blue wedding dress. It mm. might look like she's wearing a faded Swedish flag because she is Swedish, but she wouldn't <laughs> want that. <laughs> so I also didn't think that a pure white would look good because sometimes white looks very harsh and therefore a little bit synthetic. So after a lot of deliberation, I ordered this yarn here, which is called Daydream. And yeah, I don't know if you'll see this clearly. It's ha very hard to see colors on screen. But this has sort of like a soft uh, rose beige hue to it, which I did think would look good with a pale cool blue wedding dress. Mm. So I knitted up a sample in the Daydream yarn and then I laid both samples out on a pale blue business shirt to try and imagine how they might look on Sophia's wedding dress. And it was clear to me that the color Daydream was definitely the winner. And surprisingly, the yellow yarn just looked like it had an unattractive greenish tinge to it when laid out over the cool blue shirt. So while I was waiting for my yarn to arrive, I looked into beads because I've never done beading before. The pattern recommends the Japanese brands of Toho and Miyuki seed beads in size eight. Now these brands are known for their consistent shape and size of the bead, which is a sign of high quality. So a seed bead has a round or cylindrical shape with a little hole in the middle. And the higher the size number, the smaller the bead. So size 10 and 11 are very small beads and size three is much bigger. So I ordered Toho seed beads, size eight in opaque white, and I was astonished at their impossibly small size. My newly purchased one millimeter crochet hook had no chance of fitting through the hole. This made me very nervous because at that stage I didn't know you could buy 0.5 millimeter crochet hooks. So I immediately ordered another round of seed beads, but because I was nervous and overcompensated, this time I ordered size three in an opaque cream to perfectly match the Aurora yarn. And they were gorgeous beads that did work with my one millimeter crochet hook, but unfortunately they were too heavy and would just distort the delicate lace pattern. In the meantime, I'm now waiting for my second order of yarn, the color Daydream. So I order my third round of beads in size six, together with a 0.5 and a 0.75 millimeter crochet hook. And they perfectly fit together and they look really good in the lace pattern. So I'm now feeling very happy and very relieved. But the Daydream yarn still hasn't arrived and I am getting nervous and I start playing around with ideas and I get the bright idea to order some pale silvery blue beads, thinking that they might match Sophia's wedding dress and make the shawl extra unique. But when they arrive, they just look too dark and heavy, showing me again how risky it is to choose colors online. In the meantime, I have gathered enough beads and crochet hooks to start a beading business. And then finally the Daydream yarn did arrive and I was set to go using the size six Toho seed beads in a light cream beige opaque. And miraculously, these beads changed color depending on what they're reflecting. And you can see that in this picture that they perfectly match both yarns. So here the shawl is. I've put it onto two needles so I can pull it out to its full width or pretty much its full width. So this first section of the shawl, this middle section here, uses a ton of beads, as you can see, and fewer beads are used in the larger leaf and flower motifs that border the edge of the shawl down here, just 
there's just little clusters of them here and there which is very pretty. So you can apply beads to your knitting using a couple of different techniques which will really affect the way the beads look in your knitting and I have knitted up a tiny little sample here to show you how the different techniques look. So the first way is to thread the beads onto the yarn before knitting. Then when you knit, you place the beads between two stitches so the hole in the bead will lie horizontally between the two stitches. When you knit in stocking stitch, the bead will show more on the purl side of the knitting or the wrong side of the fabric because the bead is on the strand of yarn travelling between the two stitches. You can see how the beads want to pop back out to the purl side. To avoid this, you must purl the stitch directly before and after the bead. This keeps the bead on the stockinette side of the fabric and it doesn't show on the reverse side. So when you apply beads using this pre-strung method, the beads will only show on one side of the fabric. So I'm using the crochet hook method and with this method you don't need to pre-string your beads, which means you can be really spontaneous as to where you want to put your beads. Mind you, I'm not doing that. I'm diligently following the pattern and putting the beads exactly where they say to because this is my first time beading but when you place the beads you don't put them between two stitches you put the bead on the stitch this time and you can see the bead equally on both sides of the fabric so you might see see it equally here on the wrong side of the fabric so this technique of beading is really excellent to use on reversible fabrics as well I think uh, using the second technique that you're doing sounds less fiddly as well. Because otherwise think... you have to sort of pull the yeah. curl up to the stitch every time you want to use one. It's also fiddly with the crochet hook, but yeah. I think a disadvantage of having um, your yarn with strung beads on is every time you're moving it up, you're kind of wearing away at the yarn a little That's bit. That's true, yeah. So, And yeah. I, like, I like the way they are here. And you've said you've got to be really careful not to break this yarn. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I'm nervous about breaking it because it's so fine. So with this method, you put the bead on the crochet hook. Then you put the stitch into the hook of the crochet hook, and if you keep the hook at a 90 degrees angle, it's easier. Then you push the bead over the hook and the yarn and onto the stitch. And you put the stitch back onto your left hand needle and knit it as normal. And the crochet hook head needs to be fine enough to pass through the hole but not so fine that the stitch will not stay hooked into it as the bead is pushed down onto the stitch. So what I really like about the crochet hook method is that the bead sits very stably in the fabric whereas the method where the bead is sitting between two stitches sometimes it can hang down just slightly looser and then wiggle around a bit and then the beads can look slightly uneven mm -hmm. but with this method I think it looks just very stable so I like well, I it. I think the whole shawl is gorgeous. It is, it's really really pretty isn't it? It's <laughs> very beautiful. Okay, so I am three quarters of the way through and I'm feeling very confident that I'm going to have it finished and blocked in time, well in time for the wedding, so that makes me feel very happy. And I hope to get some beautiful footage of the beautiful bride wearing her shawl to show you in the next episode. Okay, so we're still in under construction because you're going to start a yes, new project. I'm going to start a new project. I'm about to knit my very first pair of socks. <laughs> <laughs> so after seeing Charlotte's book, Charming Colourwork Socks and meeting her in person, I was very inspired to knit one of her charming patterns. But before I go into that, I want to make a very quick detour. So after high school, I travelled around Australia for six months, but I spent most of my time in Sydney with my aunt Heather, who's my dad's sister. And to make some money, I started working at Black Star Bakery, which is most famous for its spectacular watermelon cake. It just has this massive slice of watermelon in the middle of it. But they also serve very good coffee. And in fact, every cafe in Sydney, and of course Melbourne, serves excellent coffee, which I wasn't used to coming from Germany. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, this is where I first developed a taste and a genuine love for coffee. And luckily, Australia established a vibrant coffee culture early on before large franchises like Starbucks took over the globe. So unlike many other countries, Australia is still dominated by independent cafes rather than large franchises. 
And I really appreciated that when I was there. Anyway, when I got back to Frankfurt, I immediately got myself a job at a small Moroccan cafe that also serves specialty coffee, just like I'd experienced in Australia. And I learned how to make a proper espresso and filter coffee because apart from all the specialty beans, there's just basic things like water temperature and pressure and uh, brewing time that you can adjust depending on which bean you use. And then there's also the milk froth, which I learned to make nice and smooth, so it just tastes better. And you can make latte art, which is when baristas make those little pitches with the milk foam. Yeah. So that was a lot of fun. But I definitely don't... ups the, the enjoyment level of a coffee, a little bit of latte art. It also ups the price, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm willing to make that sacrifice. Sadly, I don't have time to be a barista anymore, but I still love to go to our local cafe. They do seem to be getting a lot better these days. Here in Germany. Yeah, 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 for sure. And I just like to do some knitting and enjoy a really nice flat white. So when I came across Charlotte's coffee break socks, I just had to knit them. So these socks are knit from the top down with a ribbed cuff, an eye of partridge heel flap and a gusset. And the ankles are decorated with cups of steaming coffee and dappled with little coffee beans. I also like how Charlotte has added just a touch of turquoise to the design here because it's a really beautiful contrast color to the brown, which otherwise dominates the sock. So most of Charlotte's socks use stranded color work and stranded color work is less stretchy than working with a single yarn. And that's because the floats on the back of your knitting are straight. So when you stretch your color work sock uh, widthwise, You'll end up pulling on the strand itself or the float um, in an attempt to elongate it basically. But without the floats, your knitted fabric is basically made up of loops. And when you stretch a plain stocking stitch sock, you're merely deforming the loops, making them wider and flatter. I like your little diagram there. Um, a circle is not, it's more like this, but it's true. Yes. It is going to go like that. <laughs> For the untrained eye, it looks like a circle. <laughs> I think the gist, the gist works. Anyway, so that is why um, stranded color work socks are less stretchy than plain stocking stitch socks. And that's also why I was a bit nervous about starting off with stranded color work socks because I didn't want to put in lots of effort and then end up making them too tight and unwearable and I'd be really disappointed. Yeah. However, towards, uh, well, I don't know, towards the end, in the interview with Charlotte, she talks about how she addresses yes. uh, tension and gauge issues in color work socks. Yes. So that gave me the necessary confidence to just give, a, give it a go. I'm sure you'll be fine. I'm sure I'll be fine too. I've got mum sitting next to me. I'm in a luxury position. I'll just give it to her if I don't understand something. <laughs> no, but she's got some really good techniques to help you avoid yes, problems. So that's true. You'll be yep. good. So for the stranded color work, I'll be using the double-handed fair owl technique, which I have already used for some Marie Wallen designs. Mm -hmm. It's been a while, so I might need some practice. And when you start out, one of your hands won't be used to guiding the yarn, which can lead to a difference in tension. So you should practice a little bit, but then it should be fine. And also, um, you should always hold the background color in your left hand and the primary color in your right hand. Or the motive color in the right hand. Yeah, yeah, so that your motive stands out more. Now, the heel flap is also very new to me. Um, it's called an eye of partridge heel flap. It's quite pretty. I'm showing you the eye of partridge stitch on a couple of her other designs because the photos show it better. And on the right side, you alternately slip one pearl wise and then knit one. On the wrong side, you slip one pearl wise and then pearl one. So it's very simple. And you end up with a diamond pattern because you offset the slip stitch every other row. And this also makes the fabric thick and more durable, which is exactly what we're going for. I'm going to be using the recommended yarn, which is by the Giggling Gecko. It's a fingering weight and it's called Socklandia Socks Yarn. Yeah, she's a yarn dyer in Switzerland. Yeah, it's traveling by post right now, so it should arrive any day and then I can't wait to get started. Yes, it'll be very exciting. Yeah. And Charlotte is kindly offering Fruity Knitting patrons a 25% discount of all her patterns in both her Ravelry store and her Etsy store. And as Charlotte writes, her designs are inspired by nature, literature, and fairy tales, and she's very motivated in keeping her family's feet warm, especially during the long Swiss winters. And she aims to write clear, concise patterns for every level of knitter to understand. So thanks very much to Charlotte for the discount. 
So it's time now for Charlotte's interview. As I've said before, I really love picking out music to suit each guest and I'm really delighted with the music that I've matched with Charlotte. And because we had so much fun and so much laughter while we were filming the interview, I've included some behind the scenes footage during the introduction because Charlotte's humour is just really infectious and it will definitely add joy to your life and bring a smile to your face. So enjoy the interview and we'll see you in September. Yeah, thank you for spending time with us. Bye. Bye. So it helps if you breathe. Okay, so if you do this, you go... <sighs> to get sit up straight, you might prefer that. Don't want to fart. Don't want to fart. <laughs> no, 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 it's oh, just shit. Just... <laughs> Hang on, there's rolls. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's going in the patron special. <laughs> yeah. That's going in the patron special. I'm joining for that. Take a little time to smile. Make a little thing worthwhile. When the moon comes up and the sun goes down, take a little time to smile. If you think you have a care, you can find them everywhere they will vanish too like the others do if you take a little time to smile smiles were meant to give away give i'm like who else are you interviewing i'm so bad if you know <laughs> just be good on camera i promise i try won't you please just give Welcome to Fruity Knitting. My guest today is Charlotte Stone, the designer behind Stone Knits and this recently published book, Charming Colourwork Socks. And Charlotte's quirky colourful socks have been very popular during the Swiss Yarn Festival and each sock pattern has a distinct theme, whether it be nature, a hobby, a holiday or food related. And Charlotte's goal is to produce a sock design for every personality out there. And I have to say that this book is highly addictive to look through and it just might be the book to break my reluctance to knit socks. <laughs> <laughs> so Charlotte, it's really great to have you on Fruity Knitting to share your very quirky, gorgeous designs with us. Thank you so much for asking me. It's an absolute pleasure being here. I'm very happy to, to speak to you about my socks. <laughs> That's great. Okay, so let's start with your background. So just very briefly, when did you learn to knit and how did you transition into designing socks? So I learned to knit as a small child uh, with my mum and my grandmas as well. They Everybody knit. And I think, as a lot of people do, I gave up as a teenager. And then I think I, when my daughter, when I was pregnant with my daughter, uh, about 18 years ago now, I started knitting again. I was knitting baby blankets. And then we moved to Switzerland and we needed more wool knitwear because it was so cold. And that's when I started knitting socks too. I absolutely hate having cold feet. And I joined Instagram in 2015 and discovered all these amazing Scandinavian sock designers and sock knitters and started knitting colorwork socks. And my brain, I just loved it. My brain became alive with knitting colorwork socks. And I started creating my own designs a couple of years later and showed them again on Instagram and people said, can you release this as a pattern? And I love writing and I love designing and drawing and it all kind of clicked and that's when I started designing socks. So do you have a talent for drawing because you've come up with some really cute pictures for your socks? Yes. Um, <laughs> I, ever since a child I've, I've drawn, I love doing illustrations. My mum's artistic as well. She's an art teacher. Um, <clears throat> art's always been like a a thing that I've enjoyed and done and I think you yeah you can see I don't just um, take motifs that have been used before I mean sometimes I do but I like to try and create things that are unique um, and totally new so like if I do a cat I want the cat to be a new motif that's mm -hmm. not been used before so so you're not just copying already published no there are motives no I try not to obviously things with hearts and flowers yeah you can't be too unique yeah but yeah like chili peppers or coffee cups I'm going to spend a long time creating it so it actually looks realistic hmm. so um I've got 
some designs yeah. here that uh, I think it's fun to show you kind of the thought that went into them. And also sometimes they go wrong. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I'll talk through kind of where it went wrong and how I corrected it so yeah. it, it went right. Because every stitch is important, isn't it? Yeah, every stitch is like a, a pixel. Yeah. And you don't actually have that many stitches to work no. with at all. Yeah. And I like to create socks that are different stitch counts. So people with small feet, people with medium, large, yeah. extra large can knit them. So very often we've only got a few stitches that are repeated round and round and round. Yeah. So you've really got to make every stitch count. Exactly. So yeah. that's a real challenge to make the, the picture actually look recognisable yeah. and knittable. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Okay. Exactly. So, Well, let's see. What have you done? What have we got here? Okay. So um, first of all, I'm, these are this was the Berry Special socks. Mm -hmm. And they have strawberries on them. And I wanted to show that basically there are other patterns out there with strawberries on them and they're kind of sitting straight and I wanted to be different and I wanted to show because strawberries don't sit straight no. they they grow you know diagonal and I just thought it'd be fun to have like diagonal strawberries dancing across the socks like this and so I had to design it on the diagonal which I thought oh that will be easy um so I started off with a certain number of stitches and drew with the chart that I mm -hmm. use the strawberry and I, the thing is as I then realized on the diagonal you've then got a couple of rows here where there's three colors in one row and I really wanted to limit it to just two colors of mm -hmm. three colors in one yeah. row I didn't want to make it too difficult for the knitters um so I started knitting these up I'd also um you know, I really wanted to make it look strawberry shaped and I'd added an extra line here and I started knitting it up and I actually showed it to a friend who's very honest and I'm very grateful for very honest friends. And she said, oh, that's that's lovely, but they kind of look like spotty carrots. <laughs> and I was like, and I wanted to say, no, you're wrong. And I, I knew and I thought if she thinks that, a yeah. hundred people are going to think spotty carrot socks, Charlotte. So... I had to rip them out, as I often do with designs, go back to the drawing board, and I realised strawberries don't have a long piece of exactly. green. Exactly. I was thinking that. That's yeah. what makes it look more That's like a carrot. That's why it looks like yeah. a carrot. So yeah. I had to remove one of these rows. That meant there's three rows mm -hmm. of um, three colours. But my tech editor recently said, and this is very true, if they want, if people really love the the design and they'll they want to knit it, it they'll they figure it out and I've seen beginner knitters yeah. knit these yeah so I changed this so it wasn't carrot like I shortened the strawberry too as well I removed a row which is much better actually for the length than the yes. repeats yes and then also I noticed the dots here um, people prefer symmetry people prefer symmetry it looks better with the eye so I tried to make it more symmetrical. So when it knit up, it, it did look well, more... They definitely look like strawberries, strawberries. now. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. But it's amazing to see how just taking out one little stitch here yeah. makes a big difference. So every stitch really does count. Yes, and, and what also happens is sometimes it looks okay on the chart, but when you knit it up, it, it, looks, it doesn't look right. Yeah. And I even set the, the chart so it's the right size of the stitch yeah. as well. You okay. can do that, yeah. but still... Yeah, you have to knit it up. You yeah. have to make a swatch and, and knit you, it up. And you also like to try to put 3D effects in too, don't you? I do. So um, another one here is, uh, I'll quickly mention the, the spicy socks. Um, so this was another challenge. These are chilli peppers. And the problem, the problem with the chilli peppers is chilies are very long and you've got a certain number of rows really for the average foot. Yes. So with these ones, I then added a bit of detail at the end so you can adjust the length to Longer the length or shorter, shorter yeah. for, for knitting. But yeah, I had to basically be very careful with this one um, to make it look like a chilli and not have it too long as well. So it's quite a little plump chilli. <laughs> then I, I'm very careful. I try to avoid very long floats. I know that can make things quite 
ten, uh, tight with yeah. the with the tension. So I've added. I, I often do this. I added a little little flower or flower something in between. There. Yeah. And then again here with the green of the chilies, I've like added leaves. Yeah. Here. In between. And That's great. then also, um, like you said, I love the three D effect. So I've added some stitches here to make it look three D, but also so it can break up your floats as well. Excellent. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good thinking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. And now we've got something down here which shows progression yes. of. Um, of 3D effect or, or development. So we'll show the three not so good ones not first. Not so good ones. So this was, um, this was, this is a pattern in the book. This, these are the gelato socks. And I had it in my mind. I wanted, um, I, I'd seen other people had done ice creams and I didn't want to copy it at all. And I wanted big, beautiful, bright ice cream, like flopping out of the cone. That you just have to lick immediately. Exactly. <laughs> so I started off in my head I wanted very large, so I went with quite a few more stitches than I normally do for for the repeat. And I wanted three balls, because I love three balls of ice cream, not just one. <laughs> That's a bit stingy. <laughs> it's a bit stingy. and Yeah, so I started off with three balls, um, and it, I just, it didn't look great. And I added in these dots... Which look a little bit like flowers, don't they? They do. Well, I was thinking like sprinkles, like okay. but anyway, yeah... yeah. And and then this as well, I, I was trying to stop it so you don't have too long to float. But yeah, um, yeah I, it wasn't for a long time that I realised that this was actually distracting from the cone and it didn't actually look yeah. like a cone. Okay. So I was like, okay, give up on your three ball idea. Also with the book, I only had like a, a week per design to do mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. So I kind of was under time pressure. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> okay, so three, just one Threw great one in big the bin. slob. <laughs> what great big slob? But I mean, it's it's very um, square, isn't it? It's, yes. it's, yeah, I didn't. That didn't work either. I think I actually knitted this one up. That one didn't get knitted. That this one I knitted up, and I'd added this as well for the three D effect. But it it did not work. You, I needed a solid yeah. cone yeah. for it to um, really look like, like a, a cone. cone. Yeah. But also with this, you, you've got really long floats. Mm. And with socks, you really need to try to and avoid these very long floats. Because if you're twisting stitches, it makes the fabric so inelastic. So, yeah, that went into the dustbin. And then this one again. So this one I think I just removed okay the, the cone yeah. and then I thought no you're gonna have to go down to to 12 stitches because of these very long floats so we, this is what we ended up with okay with so perfect. in the end this is a bit slimmer is it yeah that's slimmer no extra yellow thing to distract you this this I think that doesn't really distract no. from the cone you've got your little 3d effect which is smaller because it's less stitches you've still got your floppy ice cream over the cone yeah so okay. it and still it does worked. look great thank you <laughs> that's really interesting to see how you really have to put in a lot of thought yeah to make it look as realistic or interesting as possible and, you and knittable to, and you have to be like aware okay well that doesn't work you have to be prepared to rip it back and and get it right yeah so. okay so this great book was published last year and it includes 25 delightful or charming <laughs> sock patterns in it and it's become an international bestseller in the category of knitting books and it's already been translated into German and Korean and is about to be translated into French, French. did you say? Yes. So that's amazing. So but there are many books on sock knitting so why do you think your book has become so or what is it offering that's made it so successful? So I think it's so successful because um, there are many different charts in here um, not just 25, there's lots of different charts, lots of different bits for the socks um, and lots of different, um, for, for different personalities and different people, different interests and there's holiday socks and the idea was that people could go back to the book anytime, any time of the year and pick and choose different socks to knit as gifts for different people in their lives. Yeah, so, or whatever mood they happen to be in for it, themselves. Exactly, of course. You don't necessarily have to knit for other people too. <laughs> but also, um, I've seen as well that people have used the different motifs as well for, you know, different things on their, on sweaters or on 
gloves or on yeah. hats. So yeah, yeah, it's been it's um, very versatile. Very versatile. And I really think in here, there's a pattern for, for everyone, for everyone you know. I was very inspired by all my friends and family when designing them. So I think there's a there's a good mix, mix in there for everybody. And you had to come up with 25 patterns pretty quickly, didn't you? I Yes, I really did. Uh, when they asked me, I was quite, quite shocked at how fast I would have to do it. But um, I actually go and round and collect and take photos of things that inspire me and interest me. And I found when I looked through this selection of photos of plants and flowers and the landscape and, and food, even animals, I found that I had plenty of inspiration. Yeah, I really did. I had, I had more than 25. So, which was, which was good because yeah. some I started and threw in the bin. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. What kind of knitter is going to be able to knit these socks? Okay, so um, when we wrote the book, the plan was for people who could just knit plain socks, but I've seen people are knitting them who are total beginners. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the socks I've seen them them knitting that have been very popular are, um, so the Swan Lake socks, Okay, these ones. Because um, that looks quite a complicated design, doesn't it? It does, but it's only two colours. Um, there's duplicate stitch, but this is, um, it's optional. You don't actually need to have that for the, to see the swan in the pattern. Um, it's only two colours. It's only a few rows on the leg here. It's not actually that complicated, and I've seen people successfully knit them. And then there's just a tiny bit of detail at the end as well. At the sock. This is great TV knitting here, so that's quite an easy one. Okay. Yep. And this is these are on the front cover. They're on the front cover. Now they're all over colour work, but the motif is very, very easy. There's there's no short uh, sorry, there's no long floats. And um You probably don't even need to trap your floats, do you? Not at all. Absolutely not at all with these ones. Um also I mean this looks difficult, it's just a variegated yarn that's coming up with lots of different colours. And yeah, this one I've seen so many beginner knitters knit this one successfully. You can actually memorize the tulip quite easily as well when you're knitting them. So, yeah, that one seems to be popular and okay. knitted successfully and, by beginners. Um, I love these. I, I love having eggs for breakfast. <laughs> so yes. I think I need to knit these. These were very popular. And again, I've seen, especially around Easter time, I saw a lot of beginner sock knitters knit them again. They're shorties, so they're not... They don't take very long at all. Few rows here for the chicken. You know, fun. You don't need to concentrate for this bit so much. And then, yeah, just a few few uh, rows of colour work for your egg. So you've here. got a, a fried egg on the, the bottom of the toe. Yeah. <laughs> like that. <laughs> just so cute. And this is quite a detailed looking chicken, actually, isn't it? You've yes. done that very well with the pixels. <laughs> uh, yes. Yes. This was a hard one. There is some, again duplicate stitch here but yeah I do say it's optional and I do put in the book okay how you do that now what about the construction what how are you doing that so all the socks in the book um they're knit top down and I'm I'm not so great at knitting top up I think one day bottom up bottom up (laughs) I think one day I I really will try to to crack it but what I found when I knit bottom up is um as you get to right the the basically the end where yeah. you bind off it's really it's very tricky you either have to be careful not to cast off too tightly and then you can't get, get it them on. on yeah and if you t- cast them off too loosely you're going to be forever pulling them up and complaining at yeah. yourself so what was happening is when i knit them bottom up i uh, was feeling really anxious the whole time about finishing the sock because I'm going to get to this this cast off and it's going to be wrong so I do I love knitting them top down and just seamlessly grafting them it's 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 yeah. simple and it's but you've got two different heels here yes so what do you include in the book so I love the heel flap and gusset personally it's my favorite it fits everyone really well so I do use this heel a lot but I found that it kind of it can constrict you with the design if you've got an all over colour work pattern mm-hmm. because you've got to decrease the stitches for the gusset if you've got a heel flapping gusset. And with the short row heel, you're basically staying at the same number of stitches. 
So if I had a heel flap and gusset here, you'd be decreasing down. Um, so you couldn't have tulips on the bottom of your sock. You'd have to have lines and I, I just... It messes up the pattern. Yeah, I didn't want that. So I do use the short row heel and I do do it for different stitch counts as well so to try and make sure it can fit people's heels properly. So. Okay. Well, look, I just have to keep looking back here because this is such a pretty picture. My sock drawer. Yeah, <laughs> such a gorgeous sock drawer. So let's have a look at some more of the patterns and um, just tell us some of the stories behind the gorgeous designs. Okay, so we'll start from the beginning, I mm -hmm. think. So this was my this was my first one. I've just got one sock here of the, the Stone Roses socks. Um, so I, I never really set out to be a sock designer at all what happened with these ones is one night in the summer we were watching mad men and there's a character in there called joan and she had a beautiful black dress on with um red roses on it with gaps in between and that night i dreamt of that pattern on a sock <laughs> and i woke up and I, I wrote it down i drew it i actually drew it on a piece of paper um and it kind of nagged away in my head and I didn't know what I was doing, but I, I knit it up. And initially I didn't realize you need more stitches for the color work sections to um, basically, because the floats make the section tighter yes. than the stockinette. So I didn't realize until I knitted a couple of pairs, oh, I need to increase, decrease, increase, decrease. Okay. So it was really, I was learning, really learning yeah. on the job. I had no clue. But that's a really good thing that you've done that. Yeah. Because it makes the end sock so much more wearable. Exactly. And this, um, so so this one, I basically, I did it and I showed it on Instagram and people said, okay, when's the pattern coming out? And I thought, okay, I can do this. I can, I can write up the pattern. I, and it was the summer. So I did them not just in black. I did them in white and I did them in pale blue. Yeah. It gorgeous. was very popular. So yeah, that was Okay, which one's One. next? Uh, okay, so um, a very popular design of mine that came out the end of 2017 were these uh, toastal socks. And again, they kind of happened by accident. They're like my family's favourites. Um, my daughter, who was nine at the time, she announced at Christmas when it was totally hectic and busy and it was her birthday's just after Christmas. And she said, Mum, I want toadstool socks. I want you to knit me <laughs> toadstool socks. And I was like, okay, right. <laughs> You're a good mum. <laughs> I might have said, ah, oh, too late. <laughs> so I went on to, I thought, okay, someone's done this. Someone's already must have yeah. created Toastal Socks. So I looked all over Ravelry. I looked all over the internet. I could not find a pattern for Toastal Socks. So kind of in frustration, I sat at her desk with some graph paper and I drew this pattern up in 10 minutes. It worked perfectly. So... Yeah, and she just went into my stash and she told me what colours, okay. knitted them up, showed them on the showed them on my Instagram, and people went mad for them. Yeah, really. Yeah, that's great. So yeah, so that was another that was a push in the right direction. Yes, yeah, she 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 has very good ideas. To be fair, she does. She's going to art school, so okay. she does come up with. Okay, <laughs> well, that's good. She can she can actually be your ghost designer. She can. <laughs> Stone knits and, and co. Yeah. Okay, so what else can can we look at? <laughs> okay, so yes, the I will have yes. to mention the eggs for Easter socks. Um, this was a really difficult design, even though it's really fun and it's easy to knit. Um, but I was kind of obsessed with making a fried egg toe. I thought, you know, we've got to, we, we can use the toe and make it more fun than just a toe. But I knit it quite a few times and it didn't look right at all um and i had to redraw it and redo it over and over again and then at one point i thought you know what i need to spell out it's an egg so how do i do that by adding the chickens yes so in this case the egg came first before the chicken yeah so okay, <laughs> okay. and if we had it in different colors it could look like something else yes right? <laughs> yes it did okay we'll move on fast moving on <laughs> okay so um so another pattern that was uh, interesting that um, kind of changed as it was being knitted, I um, created these, I call them just peachy pumpkin socks. They started off as peaches um, and I was it was one summer and I thought, oh, I can do a peach pattern. Um, and I started knitting them up. 
in summery colours. I was inspired, I think, by actually my daughter's clothing. She had purple and peach um, top. And it, I was inspired by that. Started knitting them up. And we were heading towards late summer. And I started knitting them up in autumnal colours as well showed them on Instagram and someone wrote oh on, on first glance these are pumpkins and I thought oh do I do I fight that no these are peaches and I thought no I can just work and change a few of the stitches and make it a, a j- happy jack-o'-lantern yeah like like face. this one here so yeah so I changed oh yeah so there's the autumnal there's your autumnal peach yes where they went okay. they look like pumpkins yeah so I thought, I'm going to really make it look like a pumpkin yeah. with a happy jack-o'-lantern face. And then you've got two, two patterns got for set. one. <laughs> yes. I think they look like peaches. Very so, good. Yeah. It's good to get feedback from people. It is. Yeah. Well, that's and how listen. your whole, whole career has whole is been <laughs> developed. <laughs> feedback. Okay. So, and? And then lastly, um, yes. Uh, okay. So oh, I, are gorgeous. I often make um, socks for holidays as a sock knitter I think a lot of sock knitters love making Christmas socks so it's a way of getting you into the mood and everything so these ones um actually for these ones I was in a a loop for London the yarn shop with a friend and we found a skein of yarn called figgy pudding and she said to me Charlotte you could make socks with Christmas puddings on them and I thought yeah right that like how (laughs) That sounds that sounds difficult. They look really good. They look so delicious. I love Christmas pudding. Well, it, it so it stayed actually in my head for two years before I attempted it, and it was so easy when I when I did it. I was like, gosh, that was so easy. That was so obvious. And I added candy cane stripes. Yeah, you yeah. know, really went full Christmas. And but in the back of my head, I was thinking, are these going to be successful around the world? Because I think just the UK eats Christmas pudding, maybe Australia too. <laughs> um, but you shouldn't really think about that because that kind of stifles your cre- creativity if you're thinking, oh, are they going to sell here? Then? Yeah. Yeah, ev- anyway, so I, I released them. And the weirdest thing is the most popular country uh, for these was Germany. And I, they, they just, don't eat They Christmas don't eat <laughs> Christmas pudding, but I think they just embraced it. It, it yeah. looks like Christmas. It and, looks and, wonderful. Yeah. America knitted them too. I think they look like cupcakes, Christmas yeah. cupcakes. Yeah. So. I don't mind how people interpret it at all. Just I'm as delighted as they, they knit them. it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, it, there really is nothing more wonderful than wearing beautifully fitting hand-knitted socks in winter, and the sizing really does matter. Yes. But also, adding colour work and patterning to socks can give the knitter extra challenges with the gauge. So what are the critical foot measurements a knitter needs to have to make a good fitting sock? And also, what are your best tips on correcting the gauge when you're adding colour work to socks? So the most important measurement for the socks is definitely the um, the circumference of your foot. You need Around to, the ball of the around foot. Around the ball, yeah. the, the biggest part, which, yeah, is just before your toes. And you need to know this measurement because the thing is with the length, you can have like a small, wide foot um, and you, you can also have like a long, thin foot. Mm-hmm. And you really need to know for the sock to fit properly what that measurement is round here. So for instance, if you're, if the measurement here is like 18 to 20 centimeters, you've then got to feature in um, negative ease because you want your sock to fit properly. Snugly, yeah. Slouch down into your, into your shoe. So here, if you were 18 to 20 centimeters, you'd need to have a finished circumference of 15 to 17 centimetres, so it fits okay. correctly. Which is quite a lot smaller, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is. But the thing is with that is the colour work section, mm-hmm. um, the floats make the fabric really inelastic here. Mm-hmm. So to combat this problem, I will get you in the pattern to increase your stitches for this section only. And also I suggest to... Um, get you to go up a needle size as well just to ensure (coughs) this is going to stretch to go over your your foot yeah and and we've got one here that's showing the inside because everyone likes to see the floats they really do (laughs) and your floats are looking very beautiful and you don't twist that often do you I really I really try to encourage knitters I I know a lot of people have seen it on YouTube that you have to twist a Mm. lot for colorwork socks 
I really encourage people not to because it makes the fabric so inelastic. Mm. I, I've taught many colour work sock shops and they, they're saying, I, I don't know why it doesn't stretch. And I look and they've twisted mm. a every lot. Few, every, so what, what is your longest float that you like to... So I, um, I even studied and read the Vogue knitting book mm -hmm. and it said... Um, floats can be left for one inch to 2.5 centimeters long and with a very very small gauge for sock mm. stitches that would be in total about nine or even ten stitches that mm -hmm. you can leave in a sock without twisting so i really so that, that's, that's yeah works. that's quite a lot that's great and they look lovely great neat. <laughs> <laughs> okay and what's this here for this so with um i find it very important you need to get gauge for the for the pattern as you do with any knitting mm -hmm. pattern and I just wanted to show here so this sock I knitted with a 2.5 millimeter needle and this sock I knitted with a 2.25 millimeter needle and you can see there really is quite a difference even that tiny like 0.5 of a millimeter needle there's quite a difference so you really do need to get the gauge so you get a sock that's actually going to fit your foot yeah, because people think, what's the difference between 27 stitches or 28 stitches? But actually, it makes quite a big difference. Even on, on a little a sock, sock, yeah. 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 So. Okay, that's great. And um, I have to ask you this, because you're, a, you're a family of five. Yes. There's three children, and everyone is wearing your hand-knitted socks. They do. I know a lot of people say... You don't let the children wear the or don't wear the samples, but we do. I I, yeah. I started off as a sock knitter and I love wearing socks and they yeah. are like so, my inspiration for wearing socks. So how are you looking after all of these socks, like with the mending and, and the washing and things? So um I do so first of all normally I will hand wash the socks first time, but I very often put them in the washing machine. And I have quite a funny story before I came to the Swiss Yarn Festival, I wanted them all clean, so I put them in the washing machine, I was in quite a rush, and let it go, and five minutes in, I checked, and I put it on a hot wash, oh. <laughs> and they're going to felt, they're going to be destroyed, for sure, and this is all my work, so um, I had the choice, did I let it destroy my work, or it's a very old machine, so I can't stop it easily, mid-cycle, and if I did, I was basically... Basically You're going to wreck it. Wreck it. So, yeah, I pressed every single button and pulled the power out and drained the water out. And got the, got the socks out. Got the X. <laughs> Everything was fixed. And then I put the machine on and it was code red. Everything was flashing and it was a bit broken. But So, really, it's all about the water temperature, isn't it? It really, yeah, it really mm. is. If you, you can definitely, especially with like super wash mm -hmm. yarn, you can put your socks in the washing machine, but do please like make sure you put them in a cool wash um, because yeah that temperature change is going yeah. to even to between the washing socks. and and the rinse cycle yeah because even if you put it on say 30 degrees but then the rinse cycle is cold that that, that difference shock. will also shock it so I always put everything in the washing machine but on a cold wash totally and then it, it works and yeah. we did fix the washing machine eventually the okay. neighbor did it <laughs> <laughs> and do you mend or do you just think oh time to make a new one uh I do I love making the new one I do love casting on but I I've got better at mending I've taken a few workshops and I I, I do try to mend I enjoy yeah. mending yeah. them so yeah Great. Okay, well, I am going to pick a sock pattern for myself. It might have to be that, that egg one. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. <laughs> but it's been really great to have you on Fruity Knitting, so thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Good. Thank you. <laughs> Let's say goodbye to the audience. Bye. I <laughs> think <laughs> Oh, they all fell out. Won't you please just give a few? Try a 
In 